One other, I'm going to throw you all right here, and this has got nothing to do with class, but it's got to do with computers, so that's got to do with class. I don't know if you all have read on this on Windows 10, a new feature they have got. Um, the fast startup on Windows 10, so that when you start Windows 10 each time, it starts a whole lot faster if you've got the last two major upgrades, particularly the last major upgrade. Instead of when you hit power down, power down no longer means power down to Microsoft. Okay, and y'all being networking people know there's times we need to, that we really do want to be powering down our machines. We don't want to just put them to sleep. Choosing power off or power down, whatever their term is on there, on there now does not, by default anymore, actually power off your machine. It does power it off, but it puts, it does not shut Windows all the way down, it just shuts the machine physically off. Does that make sense? Windows is not shut off, it's just put into the sleep state. So it stores a copy of the current image that's in the very memory, it stores that copy of the memory over on the hard disk, okay? on the sleep, just like if you walk off and leave it too long or whatever, okay? They all go to sleep on you to save energy. Well, that's essentially what it's doing, even if you use power down on it. It is actually turning off your equipment, so when you turn the equipment on again, you'll see it do your bias check, like depending on how much of that you've got set to actually show to you, but you see your manufacturer go go and then it goes to Windows. If you notice now, it starts up a whole lot quicker. That Windows just spins like two times on the circle and bam, they're at the logon screen. Okay? Fast startup is their term for that. That's what the power down option on the power button does for you now. If you want it where it actually shuts down Windows every time, I will show you what to do on that. And this is probably my newspaper article next week. Y'all have actually got a copy of this week's newspaper article that I wrote sitting out there in the discussion board. Um, where I wrote about that latest malware attack by Russians, terrorists, or somebody the FBI told us about that has been put onto our routers. Okay. Um, so, Let's wait seven. Oh, just for y'all's information also, we've got a 3D printer here. This is what's sitting in the box up here. I've got to get it all set up now. So I've got to assemble it and all of that. And I saved $500 or something by agreeing to assemble it myself instead of paying the vendor to do it. So they said, yeah, you should be able to do that. All right, so if I choose the power the start button there. And I choose the power right there. This one's only got power as the option. It's the only thing they've given the option on it. But you know, usually you've got power, sleep, and may have another one. I don't remember what the other one is. If instead, if you go to the control panel and go to system, and go to power and sleep and go to additional power settings because here you can choose when your screen goes shuts down and when it goes into sleep mode that those are options for you um, and if you're on a laptop remember it increases those options for you because it gives you battery and plugged in choices and if you come here there's a new option up here. Choose what the power button does. In the past, the power button did one thing. It shut down windows and shut the machine down. Okay? It was a power button.
And in here, you've got shut down settings. This first one is the one that has changed the ball game on you. Turn on fast startup. And it's got an explanation there. This helps start your PC faster after shutdown. Restart isn't affected. If you did do restart, which should be your other option there, I told you there was a third one. Restart's the third one. If you do restart, it actually does shut down Windows, shuts the machine, and restarts the machine and Windows, okay? However, if you do the shutdown, it's going to use this one which is going to be the same as if you push the power button on the computer, okay? You can uncheck this. Now to do that, they made it a little more complicated for you. Because <coughs> you notice, it's grayed out. Why in the world they did that, I don't know. Why they want to make you another step you got to do. But if you look back up here, it says change settings that are currently available. And it's not going to let me because you've got to have administrative rights to do that. I didn't realize that. In any event, if you click that button and you've got administrative rights on your machine and I don't have administrative rights so I can't get to there on this one. We could go down to the office. I could show you on the office machine because I do have administrative rights on that one. I changed it earlier today. Changed it on my home PC last night too which is why I didn't even know about that screen. When you click this button, these all become live. That's all it takes to make those live as long as you've got administrative rights. Then you can sit here and click this uncheck it. That is going to make your shutting down go a little slower because it really does shut down Windows. It doesn't just put Windows to sleep. It is going to make your startup a little bit slower also because it's actually starting Windows back up from scratch. So if you want it to be actually shutting down Windows every time and starting Windows back up from scratch when you turn the power back on, that's what you want to do, which is really my preference. Okay? But since people don't have an extra five seconds to spare waiting on the machine to come up, We'll put it to sleep instead and leave everything sitting there running. But here's a problem that can occur on that that I have run into already, which is the reason I'm discontinuing that on my machines. If you're using an external hard drive, when it does the writes to your drives, it's a delayed write sometimes. If I go and do a shutdown right there, when it was shutting down Windows before, it did all of the writes and shut down. Now, because it goes into sleep state, it still may have writes left there to do, and that's what I ran into this weekend and last weekend, that when I got to my other place and hooked up my external drive on another machine, there was stuff I had done before I left wasn't there. When I came back, it appeared because the machine, then when I turned the machine on, it went ahead and did the right. I want it to make sure it's done all of the rights before. So where you used to be told, now if you do the other approach of sit there and tell it to disconnect the device first, yeah, it does do the rights. But if I'm doing a shutdown, it's supposed to do all of that before I do the shutdown, and then I should be able to do that. You were always told either disconnect the device with the little, little logo thing down there on the bottom right on the taskbar, or do a full shutdown and everything will be written there. That's not true anymore. It may not have been written there if you're using their new approach. Does that make sense to everybody? That's uh, just a warning to you, okay? In my case, it, it didn't really hurt me after all because I had actually uploaded the files. They were the church files. And I had actually uploaded them that I needed to do some more work on. And I had, in both cases, uploaded them to Dropbox. And they were sitting in Dropbox for me. So I just, I had to go out to Dropbox and download it. And I had files to work with anyway. But 
if I hadn't uploaded them to Dropbox, I would have had to sit there and do an hour's worth of work again. Because after all, it's five hours from where the stuff was really located at, and I wasn't going to drive back to that. But it would have cost me a whole bunch of time. Because of uh, Microsoft deciding they're going to make it look like Windows starts a whole lot faster now with Windows 10. That they've made it start a whole lot faster when they really haven't. They're playing games. And I say, I think, pretty sure that's going to be my article for next week. But that should be helpful information to y'all. Um, and there are going to be some people get real mad about that when they run into like I ran into. First off, they're going to, because your first thing is, did I really save it or what? Why did this not happen? And when I went out and grabbed it from Dropbox and I went, well, it was done. And then that's when all of a sudden, we wait a minute, I remember something I've read and it started clicking together on me. All right, chapter three, you're going through dynamic routing, because we said we were going to try to do two and three tonight, even though three is not till next week. I'll follow on that, but we're going to try to just double up some to get stuff done. All right, in chapter three, they talk about dynamic routing. Now we're going to talk about routing protocols that I told you about. Okay, so the first one they talk about is RIP, Routing Information Protocol, and that they explain that one to you. Uh, RIP 1, it says, was released in 1988, but most of what it's based on goes all the way back to the invention of the Internet in 1969. Okay, when ARPA came up with ARPANET. Then RIP version 2 came along to accommodate the growth in our whole environment, as they put it. But it doesn't scale now to our larger implementations of networks today, which I'll agree with. So. Now the newer ones that they're going to tell you about is OSF, OSPF, Open Shortest Path First, and that's going to come back to that administrative distance. Is it's going to measure things in terms of how far are things located? Okay, and then. ISIS, which we're really not going to deal with at this point in the course, that's really, I think that's in Cisco 3 or 4. And then Cisco came up with their own protocols to deal with this, that they developed iGRIP, interior great gateway routing protocol, IGRP, and then they came up with a newer version of it, so you really won't see much about iGRIP anymore. They came up with a newer version of it, which is the enhanced version, which is EI grip. And that's the pronunciation of both of those. Okay? And both of those are very scalable routing protocols. And so they give you a whole time frame on all of that and how they all work. Um, And actually, RIP has gone on to an another version of it now that I forget to mention usually, which is NG, which is next generation. Um, that it's the newer one, but it didn't catch on at all. But you will hear plenty about RIP and RIP version 2. I already told you about what happens with dynamic routing. It's the routers advertised each other what they their routing tables and they learn from each other and increase their routing tables. Depending on the 
protocol you're using is how often does it update those tables. Okay? And that's where you sometimes will find in Packet Tracer and on real equipment that it will sit there and take a while for some things to take effect. Because it may be in a minute and a half before it ever advertises it out again, so the other one doesn't learn about it until that time period. That's where the nice part on Packet Tracer having that fast forward time is real handy, that button that jumps you forward 30 seconds in time every time you click it and makes it much faster. Um, they again tell you why you would use static and then they tell you advantages and disadvantages of that static and dynamic. Um, static, it works well in a small network and easy to set up. In a large network it can get very complex and very crazy trying to set it all up and implement it. Um, gives yourself a whole lot of work. Um, static is very secure. There are no advertisements. Disadvantage is complexity keeps increasing as the network grows and gets worse and worse on that one. So you may have better security but if you're not careful you end up directing traffic wrong and you just bust at your security anyway. So if you got a real complex one, you really probably don't want to do that. Um, with static, if a, route, a link fails, a static route cannot reroute it, that you have to have a manual way to get around it, okay? That you got to build around on that. And so with dynamic, it'll work in all our topologies where there's multiple routers involved. If you only got one router there, static's going to be fine for you. It's independent of network size. And the topology automatically adjusts continuously as the physical topology changes, the logical topology is going to change also. So what it sees there. Um, says the disadvantage it can be more complex to implement because trying to get it using those other routing protocols can be more complex for you than just a simple static entries. It is less secure and you got additional configuration settings you got to set up. And you're setting it based on the current topology. And it does require more CPU and RAM to do it. Because after all if you're making the machine think it requires more resources. If you make us think we have to use more of our brain, right? So then they go in and so they talk about route RIP version 2 um, and you've actually really seen on that already. Um, auto summary is the ability to have it summarize routes into a single route automatically where we talked about in the previous chapter you could actually do it. You can also tell it do auto summary itself and when it sees routes that can be combined that it will combine them to not have as many entries in its table. Um, so you can set that on there. You can set what your metric and your distance is involved. Advertising um, that you're going to activate RIP, RIP and then it will take care of it. Now, RIP version 1 was a classful routing protocol. All of the others, including version 2, are classless. And that's going to be reason not to use RIP version 1. But remember on class, that meant on our addresses, and remember they had the four sections to it, if it's classful, which version 1 was, it's saying networks only break, the difference between the network and the host is purely on the periods. There is no subnetting within it. Y'all follow on that? And that's not done anymore. Okay? So RIP version 1 is just not going to work anymore. Um, Show IP protocols will show you your different protocols that are running out there. 
and they show you the examples on that. If you want to enable RIP version 2, to enable RIP version 1, you did router RIP, and that enabled RIP version 1. To enable RIP version 2, it is router RIP, again, oddly enough. And then you say version 2 to tell it actually we're going to use version 2, not version 1. As opposed to IP where you put the V6 on it and just change what you're using on it, this one you add a separate command to tell it to go to the second version. Y'all follow on that? I like the IP approach instead of the RIP approach. But the other part is, like I've also commented several times, you're not going to really use RIP that much. But RIP's a good one to start from to have some idea. Um, show IP route again will show you the whole table. Um, if you put begin gateway on the back of it, it tells you whether you have the gateway of last resort set, that quad zero address. You can disable summarization on it. Um, and that's just by doing no auto summary. By default, RIP version 2 is going to want to auto summary for you. But if you don't want it to, that you want it, all of the networks to be distinctly separate, do the no auto summary. But you're not going to do that very much. And anytime it learns on updates on RIP, it will send out those updates in turn on every interface that RIP is enabled on. Now, you can disable those advertisements from going out certain ones. Ooh, that was a bright flash of lightning that just went back there. I'm surprised we haven't had any thunder off of it. I guess they just took out Dade County on it, if that's what it was. Um, so you can work with that on that of, because you don't want to advertise out areas where you're not, you don't need those advertisements, because that's wasted bandwidth, that's more traffic. I told you it was a bright one, because you're listening to that rumble now, that wasn't a simple rumble. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> so, and then you can propagate information on out on that. Um, you can set the default route out on one router and then you can tell it you don't have to set it on all your other routers within your network if you will do the default information originate command on that router it tells it send this default one out to every other route rip router that helps you setting up a multiple router network doesn't make any difference in me stopping class right now because y'all all get wet and all of y'all do probably melt. I don't think y'all would clump like salt. Um, so then they talk to you through that one. They talk about discontinuing contiguous networks and that's ones that are separated by um, a classful network. Okay. Now bear in mind you're going to have very few classful networks anymore so you're not going to have very often a discontiguous network because you're not, it is popping out there. So they show you about how to set all those up, um, and that if you're set, and that when it does pull them in, it will put them in the routing table and it will tell you which one it learned it from and how it learned it. Um, so it will tell you where did it learn the route from, 
It will tell you what the destination network is. It gives you the administrative distance, which is the number assigned to the routing protocol unless you told it use a different administrative distance. It will tell you what the metric is, which is to reach that network that you've added into your table there, how many hops is it going to take to get to it? Y'all follow on that? Because as you're looking at all the different routers within your network, you, you know about routers that are several routers away, so they could be several hops away on it. But you're not going to set up across the whole internet that way. Y'all follow on that? That's just within your network. Um, and then you'll set the next hop, which is the same thing we did here, that it will find that and knows where does it go to to there. And that's built in there. And it's got a time stamp on there, and that is important. When did it last learn this? Dynamic entries of any type on your routers have time stamps. And after a certain amount of time, they do expire, and it drops them. And so the fact it knew about where a network was, if nobody accesses it for a certain amount of time, they'll forget about where it was and then I'll go back to the default one again for it. Does everybody follow on that? So it's not where it remember because after all, if it hasn't heard anything else about that network again in a certain amount of time, odds are it may not be connected to it anymore. So that route may be worthless anyway, so we need to get rid of it so we don't waste trying to use that route on it. Because y'all want to get the best response on it. Um, then they talk about level one routes. And level one parent routes and level two routes child routes and the ultimate route. Ultimate route goes back to our default gateway. What to do if nothing else works. Okay? <laughs> Level one routes. The subnet mask is less to less than is equal to or less than the class fault one. So it's where it's been subnetted. Okay? Or that it's a supernetted route. The default route will actually be a level one route. Because it's got a subnet mask there with the zero, 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 zero. A level one network route that is been subnetted, the one that before the subnetting is actually a level one parent route. Okay? And that makes sense. That if you got a level one, you can have that. But if it was subnetted from another network, then the one that it was subnetted from is parent. And a level two child route is a subnet of a class full network address. So it's not where you've subnetted, subnetted. Okay? Where a level one could be a subnetted, subnetted, but a level two is actually just the primary subnet of a class full address. So notice these are falling back to the class full part as part of how they're referencing, which again tells you that that's not going to really be that much done anyway. Um, and then they walk you through and talk about how it does the lookup process and goes and finds them. And when it goes and looks at the possible links, the one that has the longest match on it's the one it's going to choose. So it chooses with the longest match. And then they go through and talk about from IP version 6 which is actually doing the same thing as IP version 4, except for using IP version 6 addresses. Okay? 
And you just have to remember you're using the 128 versus how long? How many bits long is a version 4? IP version 4 addresses are how many bits long? How many bytes long? Hmm? 32 bits. 32 bits. Okay, and that one strikes me as even a shorter chapter because what color is the next page? Blue. Blue. So we have just made it through three and four. Two and three. Two and three. Or something. We have made it through two chapters. Two. <laughs> so we've done two and three. Since we've done three, I will do this for y'all. Because next week we've got actually three and four is what's on the schedule. I will go ahead and open up test three for this week also. I didn't say just this week. So you can still take three like it was originally scheduled next week. But if you go ahead and get three done this week and want to go ahead and take the test, you can go ahead and take it this week. Does everybody follow on that now? So, I'll let you actually get ahead of a test on this this week since we got ahead tonight on it. 